as nearly all systems of philosophy, both Eastern and Western, seem to agree that there is room for improvement in that part of man which he terms himself. If, however, he assumes that this person, this self, is merely a long ray of divinity, then he is against a rather complicated situation, because a divinity under these conditions would seem to be the inevitable cause of absurdity in a great many cases. The individual, being full of errors and weak of spirit, would seem to bear witness to a divinity that was deficient in many things. Neither Eastern nor Western philosophy will accept this. They will not accept that the God power in any organism is in itself inadequate. Rather, the attitude is that we are mistaken in attempting to determine what part of man's nature is essentially divine. That we have substituted in a subtle way mind for spirit. That we have assumed that intellect is the highest part of man, and that to the degree that he thinks he is divine, even though his thoughts are not divine. If, however, the mind was the God in man, we could scarcely face uh, the history of civilization and explain it rationally. For it is a continual record of trial and error, of absurdity and crime. It is a record of man's inability to govern his own affairs or the affairs of others. Thus, we must begin to isolate in some way, uh, the personal self which we experience from this larger self which we do not experience. In the Gnostic system, uh, the larger self was the over-self, Emerson's over-soul. But there was something in man that is superior to the self as we know it. And uh, while lacking facilities for analysis, we can only assume that this is a plus kind of self. We must assume that inside of man there are also levels, and that the level of the mind is not identical with the level of consciousness itself. If this be uh, acceptable, and there is so much evidence to sustain it that we can hardly argue the point successfully, then uh, the nature of the self becomes a serious issue in philosophy and has been given a lot of attention in Vedanta, in Zen, in Buddhism generally, in Yoga, in Tantra, and in the mystical sects of the Near East, the early Christian mysteries, the Egyptian and Greek schools, and even among the more civilized peoples of the Western Hemisphere in ancient times. Every nature, nation, gradually at, as ascending the cultural ladder, has come to the point where it has had to face the source of right and wrong as social forces. And the only way in which this source could be found, apparently, was within man himself. Therefore, there has to be a fountain of right and wrong in man. Now, right and wrong do not necessarily become identical with good and evil. Uh, right and wrong seem rather to be correctness or incorrectness of judgment. An individual does not always do wrong because he is evil. He makes mistakes because he is ignorant. We cannot necessarily convict the ignorant person of being evil, but he certainly is not in a condition of internal resource uh, to achieve the greater good for all concerned. Therefore, rightness to our common thinking becomes a proof of sound judgment, wrongness of unsound judgment. And man is capable of both forms of judgment. 
And whatever part of man is therefore polarized between right and wrong judgment cannot be regarded as infallible. The, the Buddhist system, therefore, perhaps offers as clear a picture as we can find of the concept of selfness. Of course, Buddha did not originate the notion. He merely borrowed from certain of the earlier Brahmanic and Hindic teachings. And these, in turn, perhaps, uh, fuse with others in the remote past to form one vast and mysterious amalgam of ancient belief. In any event, however, he did clearly point out that we must assume that man is divisible into three essential levels or conditions of being. The highest of these may be considered to be reality itself. And with our present equipment, we seem to have no skill in determining the nature of this reality. Reality is more than a hypothesis, however. Reality is an essential according to the experience of consciousness itself, but it cannot be defined by the consciousness that accepts the need for it. Reality must in some way, therefore, remain always and forever the thing as it is. Of the nature of things as they are, we are notably deficient in knowledge. We hardly know what we are. We are unable to turn to another person and with a few uh, quick remarks determine the nature of that person as he is. We are forced, therefore, to assume that reality is because everything that exists has to have an essential, factual nature of some kind. But the essential fact is in the case of the creation of which we are a part, always hidden. It is hidden behind the veil of first cause or of eternal causation. Now, most philosophical systems favor eternal causation. Most religious systems favor first cause. Whether we consider, however, causation to be a beginning or an eternal process, its nature and substance is beyond definition. We have never in the history of human knowledge been able to create an ample and sufficient definition for the nature of absolute being. And there doesn't seem to be any probability that we will do so in the near future. This concept of, of essential or absolute being, however, is one that has to exist because there has to be some kind of a fact behind all appearances. For all appearances are themselves aspects of fact. All living things must therefore bear witness to life, even as all intellectual things must bear witness to intellect. All created things must bear witness to a creating force, pressure, or principle. Thus, the root of all things is inevitably uh, in being itself. We have no proof whatever that this being has ever directly addressed a person. We have no uh, proof whatever that this total being has ever been personalized in the sense of presenting a personal nature of any kind. Yet we are assured that this unpersonal or impersonal thing is the source and root of an infinite diversity of personalities. Yet all these personalities have one weakness in common. They are unable to adequately define their own source. Now this is the primary of the Buddhist concept. And the concept of the condition of this is of course uh, concealed under the general terminology of the Mahaparinirvana, or the state 
of absolute, unconditioned existence. Uh, this is the goal of Southern Buddhism, uh, with the uh, monk attempting to the complete elimination of all conditioned existence to restore identity with an utterly unconditioned existence. To do this, he must cease to be a being or person. He must no longer have any of the conditioning or qualifying attributes of mind, emotion, or sensation. Assuming that such a condition would be conceivable, uh, Western scholars have generally taken the ground that to remove all of the attributes by which the individual can experience or interpret experience must leave this individual in a vacuum. Therefore, that actually, Paranavana is extinction. Buddha says no, it is not, but admits frankly that the consideration of its essential nature is not only impractical, but impossible. The second sphere or area of Buddhist contemplation, therefore, is what might be termed in modern psychology uh, the subconscious nature of man. The subconscious nature of man is an area of subjective growth. This area of subjective growth surrounds the central core. It is made possible because the core exists. It is made possible because the essential root energies of the subconscious are derived from this thing which is not well described as superconscious, but is certainly extraconscious so far as we know. This so-called subconscious, therefore, is built up not from the conditioning influence of being, but from the conditioned influence of environment. The subconscious world, with its psychic pressures, its psychic problems, and all of the various records of psychic intensities, must therefore be held to be a subjective personality. The subconscious is not essentially different from the conscious external person. Rather, it is the submerged part of the objective consciousness, which, like the iceberg, has most of its mass submerged. Thus, the so-called objective personal consciousness of man is a fragment floating on the surface, and beneath this surface is the greater part of the mass of this nature which we call the subconscious. The subconscious exercises the conditioning effect upon the personality. The subconscious is the depository of the records of the reaction of man to experience and condition. Therefore, into the subconscious, as into a capacious memory, is gradually stored away all the experience phenomena that we know. Psychology today thinks of the subconscious as merely a one-life instrument. Eastern thinking considers the subconscious not as a one-life instrument alone, but as carrying within it the impulses and pressures of the entire cycle of rebirth. However, as the objective man is not aware of, the, of his relation to karmic indebtedness, so the subjective man may not be either. But as objective incidents are conditioned by karmic laws, so subjective reflexes and attitudes are conditioned by karmic law. If then we are really looking for the so-called self or the ego, we are inclined to suspect that it lies in this subconscious nature. That the subconscious nature represents uh, the manager or directional power uh, over the objective personality. 
that the objective personality and the subjective personality are the hemispheres of one sphere, and that what we call experience moves back and forth between the visible and invisible hemispheres of the conscious and subconscious nature of man. Thus, perhaps, in our Eastern philosophy, we have a parallel to modern psychological thinking that somewhere in this mystery of the subconscious lies the chemistry which produces the mystery of self. The self is this area of subconsciousness. That it represents the consequence of certain experience being continuously pressed back into a subconscious uh, container that this experience is in various degrees of maturity, that it is influenced constantly by the various levels by means of which man accepts or receives into himself the stimuli which produce knowledge, wisdom, understanding, growth, a reflex and reaction. Outside of this subconscious self, which is the second circle of the like of this uh, concentric bullseye target, is a third or objective circle. And this is the circle which really uh, extends to the outer circumference of man's body, the skin. It is in this uh, circle that the objective consciousness exists with its final relationship to the environmental world. This third, or so-called conscious being, uh, is simply man living in this world according to the experiences of this world, acting and reacting according to the immediate stimuli of this world, and passing through a wide cycle of diversified activities as a result of the region in which he exists as a physical being. This objective uh, uh, body contains within itself, this physical personality contains within itself a series of sensitive areas which we call sensory perceptions. The purpose of these sensory perceptions is to sense, and that is to become aware of. And these uh, sensory perceptions may also be regarded as perceptive, namely that they do sense, that they perceive, that they are continually taking in to themselves uh, stimuli from the exterior or from the outer world. A continuous bombardment of phenomena uh, and of physical sensation move in through the sensory perception and finally uh, perceptions and finally unite as a result of the common sense or the mental coordinator and the mental coordinator is Buddha's sixth sense it is this sense which must put together all of the fragments of external phenomena and make something out of them and what it makes out of them causes the individual who possesses this instrument to suddenly declare, this I believe, or this now becomes evident to me, or perhaps with a little greater gusto he will say, this is so. It is so because it is testified to by a certain coordination of sensory perception. Yet we know from the beginning of existence that these sensory perceptions are not infallible. We know that under normal conditions they are usually adequate. We know that if the individual does not abuse them or if they are not injured or in some way lose their proper sensitivities, uh, these sensory perceptions produce a constant stream of testimony, and that these testimonies are reasonably consistent with the phenomena over which they exercise 
uh, sensory power. Thus, when the eyes say, this is a tree, we have a right to assume that the tree is there. Although, of course, we must agree with Aristotle that the word tree gives us no clue as to the real nature of the thing we see. It only represents its shape and the species which we have associated with it. All the terms by means of which we make meaning out of perception are terms which we have applied to the various things that we receive by sensory impulse. But there is no denying that when we say there is a table, there is something that for all practical purposes resembles a table. There is no doubt that when we hear a sound, that what we hear is our own interpretation of a rate of vibration, that this rate of vibration has been recorded and is being carried into the mental coordinator within ourselves where the nature of this vibration is more clearly differentiated and we decide whether it is concordant or discordant. Thus we are constantly receiving these testimonies. But the next problem that we have to face is that all operations of sensory perception uh, depend upon the condition of the organism through which they pass. Not only must we consider the nature of the thing seen, but we must also figure the nature of the thing seeing if the validity of the phenomena is to be determined. Now there are certain common things about which this validity problem is comparatively unimportant. If a number of us at the same time seem to see that it is raining, it is probably raining. Our testimonies of sense perception will leave no great difficulty of understanding this. But no one yet in this world has ever been content to let it rain. Whenever rain is noted, something has to be done about it. Wherever we turn in our way of life, uh, sensory reflexes are subject to continuous interpretation. And interpretation is nothing more or less than previous experience applied to new experience. The individual forever seeking to solve the mystery of the unknown by recourse to that which is already either known or believed. If it is already known, his new interpretation may be adequate. If it is only believed, his new interpretation may be inadequate. So constantly and continuously in our way of life, phenomena entering into the experience of man through the sensory perception is subject to modification in that most vital of all areas, the mental coordinator. We know outwardly, for example, that if a person goes to school who has no interest in the subject, he will not learn well. Now, one of our problems today is to try to determine what kind of education is suitable to various persons of various attainments and attitudes. It is quite obvious that what we cannot use in this world, we almost certainly abuse. What we cannot understand, we must inevitably misunderstand. We are so constituted that this is the way life operates. If this be true, then, uh, this determination of the nature of phenomena is subject to the continual interpretive power of the mental coordinator. And this mental coordinator has in turn a very conditioned kind of existence. Because for the most part, this coordinator builds its philosophy of life from its environment. Thus, uh, an individual, we will say, looking out into the world and seeing a world torn by war, 
as we have at the more or less at the present time, certainly torn by the constant fear of war. With the coordinator receiving the continual sensational justification of the general misery of external conditions, may gradually become atheistic because there is no evidence to that coordinator through its constantly increasing experience with externals that there is anything good in the world. This coordinator, however, in the midst of all of the confusion and war, may experience personally the significance of affection, uh, regard, or love. Suddenly the coordinator receives a new kind of testimony. But this testimony may be met with the gravest of suspicions as the result of other testimonies from society as to the present condition of human emotional and social relationships. So what we gradually have is a mental coordinator contaminated by its own external environment. Just as a child brought up in a very unhelpful environment, they have its moral nature disturbed simply because this disturbance is constantly carried into the coordinator. The coordinator can have no opinion or no attitude superior to the sum of the interpretation of the sensory perception. Thus we have a little closed package here, a little circuit of circumstances in which the individual, having been set in a belief by any situation, begins to censor his own sensory perception. He, he declines to accept as valid any sensory message that conflicts with, it, with the opinion of the coordinator, who now becomes a little despot. He now becomes a little fixation, uh, perhaps utterly intemperate, utterly intolerant, completely bigoted in some way. He may be the absolute skeptic, or he may, by some other interpretation, be the easy believer, so gullible that he falls for every notion that occurs. But any event, this coordinator now develops the same kind of censorship tactics which we often observe as a misfortune in human society. It simply fails to register what it does not want to register or it completely disproportions the values of what it does register. Uh, the small act of the friend becomes more important than the passing generosity of an adversary. The individual is more responsive to flattery than he is to criticism. He is more inclined to accept uh, the opinions of those who agree with him than contrary opinions that may be wiser and better. So little by little, this coordinator uh, builds a subjective, integrated personality, invisible, but which constitutes the true character of the person in the body which we see. This character, with its weaknesses and its strengths, with its mistakes and its virtues, with its blind spots and its death spots, uh, with its thoughtlessness and its thoughtfulness, with its inclinations to fear and to worry, with its uncontrolled jealousies and its unreasonable ambition. All this conglomeration simply represents this endless motion of external phenomena moving inward to a coordinator that is using it to continually build the dominant attitude which it wants. The dominant chemistry finally comes to the top, takes control of the rest, and we have what we call a personality. This personality is certainly subject to continuous change, but where it is once locked by an extremely adamant situation, a completely uh, unchanging determination to accomplish certain purposes, 
or with complete determination to continue exactly as it is in all habits and in all practices, this person can resist a tremendous amount of change. This individual can be taught without learning, can see numerous examples of the mistakes that it makes without changing, and can cheerfully and willingly maintain a bad disposition fully knowing that it is bad, but because that is the disposition it desires to have. Somewhere in this mystery muddle and mix-up uh, slowly emerges the vision of this thing we call the self that senses. This self, which is the summary of the sensory processes, is the self which most of us know. We do not know why it acts as it does. We do not know why it gets us into trouble morning, noon, and night. But we do realize that it is a continually conditioning influence, and that of, in most instances, that which it wishes will be accomplished, that which it determines will be done, and its every whim uh, will change the life of the person into conformity with that whim. So man's inner life becomes uh, a strangely distorted shadow of that which it might be. And out of this conglomeration becomes the only uh, self that we really know anything about. And in many instances, it is pretty poor. Yet we also realize that there exists in the world and always have existed certain persons in whom the self seems to be doing better. We realize that this self, with all its conglomerates and all its mysteries, does not produce only confusion. That out of this self also there emerges genius. Uh, that out of this peculiar subconscious mystery has come not only the Hitlers, but the Leonardos. Not only the Caesars and Napoleons, but the Beethoven and the Raphaels. We realize that out of this same compound must also have emerged through experience those persons who have suddenly sensed the need of a superior standard of living. That some way this self will and can testify against itself that it can, in some cases, develop direct revulsions against its own limitations, and that out of the constant confusion comes finally the great lesson, namely, that there will only be confusion, that either the entire pattern has to be reintegrated, or the individual will continue to be his own worst enemy till the end of time. So nature does not intend this to happen. Therefore, the very processes of error which arise within the subconscious become unendurable. They force us to correct in order to survive. And the, the principal instrument by means of which this corrective is induced, of course, is physical pain and mental suffering or emotional suffering. The individual gradually discovering that the intemperance of the coordinator is destroying his peace of mind and his common good ultimately begins to investigate this matter, ultimately begins to experience a new quality within the mind itself, and that is the quality of misfortune arising from wrong conduct. Out of this pattern, the mind itself begins to develop the moral instinct. And this happened undoubtedly long ago. So that in most individuals, a considerable measure of moral instinct is present. This in its own turn has a tendency to moderate or reduce the intensities of error. Actually, of course, all of these intensities within the individual have flowed out into society 
where they have produced what we call the common state of man. And these pressures moving out into, into society have required the building of police forces, fire departments, and numerous other protective mechanisms to save men from each other. Gradually it has become apparent in action that the subjective pressures of selfishness, self-centeredness, bigotry, and things of that nature produce dangerous consequences in society. In substance, the ignorant individual cannot get along with others and cannot be safe from the ignorance of other people any more than they can be safe from his. Out of this uh, um, obvious situation, another type of experience mechanism comes into manifestation. By this experience manifestation, the individual learns from his own mistakes. He also learns by seeing other people make his mistakes or similar ones. He observes what happens to them as a result of doing the same things that he does. He observes a common disaster. He finds that others come to the same sorry end that he has. And from this comes the gradual building of the experience of a pattern of utilities, a pattern of things which must be done or must not be done if the general security of the group is to be preserved. As the general security of the group is essential to the comfort of the individual in an organized society, he must gradually take greater and greater cognizance of the group. He must gradually assume his part of the social responsibility for the group. He must cooperate with others. He must contribute to the common productiveness of his kind, or else the general situation deteriorates, deteriorates so rapidly that he himself is imperiled. This is another cycle of information moving in upon the person. So as man lives in a world in which just about anything imaginable can move in upon him, and some things he can't imagine, just as he can not only be moved in upon by realities, but by his own interpretations of realities, he is not only living in space, but he can populate this space with the extensions of his own imagination. And this population can also move in upon him. He is the victim of his own imaginings just as much as he is the victim of factual conditions. And his own imaginings differ from facts to the degree that his own common sense is distorted. Little by little, then, he finds uh, a very interesting and intriguing situation. He is caught in a kind of a vice between an upper and lower millstone. He is unable to completely extricate himself from this constant process of interchange by which new phenomena is continually moving in upon the sensory coordinator. And the coordinator, in turn, is moving out certain impulses, certain instincts, appetites, and attitudes which set up new re reactions outside, and these reactions, in turn, move in. It's out, in, in, out, constantly. This gets to be what might be termed a psychological rat race. Things get more complicated all the time. The individual is like the character in Alice in Wonderland who runs and runs and runs and has to in order to stay where they are. They never seem to be getting very far. And this coordinator changes so slowly and becomes so continuously burdened with external phenomena uh, that it is very difficult to know just exactly what the facts are at any given time. We know, for example, what must have happened to the mental coordinators of millions of German people during World War II, when their entire common sense was completely befuddled uh, by one man, Adolf Hitler. This man uh, appealed uh, to a certain level of frustration was so great 
that probably one of the best educated groups in the world lost its mind and its common sense. This can happen and can result in the most hideous conditions. All these pressures, however, move in from the outside, and nature has set up the coordinator in the mind to make sure that false pressures do not take over. However, this coordinator is toxic because of the vast amount of false pressure that has already accumulated. It is also uh, without the final means of solution. It is bombarded too continuously, and the individual is doing very little to actually equip this coordinator for its job. Actually, the mind could stand quite a bit of training. But the kind of training it needs, it does not get. So the coordinator has nothing done to help it to grow. It has to work only through trial, error, and suffering. So the time comes when we so-called educate the mind. We send the individual to school for over 20 years on the ground that when we do so, we are now going to have an individual who knows how to think. He graduates, but he does not know how to think. He has been learned, taught, perhaps, to make a living. He has actually been trained out of a large part of his common sense. He has been taught things which have valid meaning only in the small economic and industrial structure which he calls modern society. Anything that might help him, save him, clear him, bring him into organization and integration is probably missing from his education. So the coordinator has no help. It can only continue uh, to take in this tremendous amount of phenomena and try in some way to, uh, to put it into reasonable order. Most of the reactions of the sensory perceptions have become toxic. The integration is no longer good, and this coordinator, uh, therefore, becomes little better uh, than a bookkeeping system for passing opinions, notions, and pressures. Having achieved uh, so little with its own nature, it then becomes the basis of this thing which we call the self, the self which is merely a symbol of what probably we will have to do next, of the only thought we could have at that particular moment because it is the only thought that uh, he gets pretty much uh, fucked up over the whole thing. He finds a way to be important. And there is nothing that is more uh, uh, quick to gain attention than a good hysteria. So the individual uh, frequently finds for the first time in his life that he becomes important. And this is not a good discovery. Because an individual who is important simply because he is a nuisance is not gaining the proper relationship with life. Where is the problem actually to be faced? Is it possible for us to so polish and cleanse this internal coordinator that it becomes pristine, pure, and incapable of further error? Uh, can we fumigate it? Can we do something with it to get rid of the unfortunate situation that exists there? I doubt it very much if this is the approach, and I believe this is the difference between Buddhistic psychology and Western psychology. The Buddhistic psychology says that you can't do it this way, that the cause of the whole situation is the intensity of the sensory perception to the acceptance of phenomena, that the correction has to be made in connection with the intake of material, that the individual can only finally put his life in order when he provides through the sensory perceptions 
a reasonable and factual group of evidences. And only when the mental coordinator is relieved of the pressures contributed by the constant supporting of previous opinions. So that actually, if we're going to get rid of this deluge that is accumulating and rising like Noah's oblivion within ourselves, we must turn off the water. And in this case, the flood originates in this tremendous openness to an infinite diversity of meaningful and meaningless phenomena. The individual has no power of discrimination. He accepts usually that phenomena which creates the greatest intensity of reaction. Quality is not the consideration. He hears the loud noise much better than he hears the soft sound. He hears the loud despot much louder than he hears the quiet sage. Everything is in terms of the quantity of impact, the broad general acceptance of ideas, and very little is concerned with their quality, their value, or their integrity. So the individual has a self now that is a pretty much a tyrant, that is in a sense befuddled, that if this self is to a measure also bewitched by the conditions under which it exists, it can be so confused and so completely disoriented that it collapses in mental illness. But all it really is is an overburdened mental interpreter. It is a, a, a comparatively low level of employee who is given the job of handling the whole business, which he cannot do, and then is constantly tested by suggestions, advice, criticism, and opinion by other people. Under such conditions, even an able mind is not able to function properly. The self being, in a sense, therefore, the product of all this process. Now, the Eastern philosopher prefers to think of this sensory self as the victim of sensory pressure, brought into existence by the infinite and infinitely complicated chemistry of sensory testimony, mental interpretation, conduct moved by this interpretation, which sets up new situations in society, which again are picked up by the sensory perceptions, taken back and reinterpreted. Around this cycle again and again and again, which is almost like the mysterious wheel of the law which goes around and around while individuals cling desperately to the spokes of their own opinions. Break through this sensory self-process, then, the first step, according to Eastern philosophy, is to realize that it isn't very important, that what we think about things is not very important that whether we ever gratify certain pressures in our own nature is not important. What we feel about this and that is not important. Because actually the only person that can have important ideas is a person who has a, has a better than average integration of all these factors. For the most part, therefore, we are punishing ourselves, whipping ourselves, in a desperate effort to prove something we cannot prove, and that is that we are always right. This is the hardest thing in the world to prove, and many individuals have battered themselves into oblivion trying to do it. The uh, relaxation of this pressure into the Eastern way of thinking is simply this detachment process. The process of the individual releasing the power of his own attitudes by gradually lowering the 
uh, vitality or libido that she expends on the assimilation of phenomena. Suppose we have here five sensory perceptions, which are carrying tremendously intense records. A tremendous amount of energy is being used to convey messages along these sensory channels. These messages are of a wild diversity of things, all of which, by the way, pertain to the outside anyway. We can examine the outside to the end of time, and we'll never solve the mystery of the inside. But that doesn't concern us. We are constantly taking in more and more of all these things we hear about, read about, and uh, which we observe and see and taste and feel in the physical sensory perception range. If, for example, this is all carried on a kind of an electric circuit, a certain energy carrying these messages continuously, uh, the intensity of the messages, the continuous transmission of them, depends upon this energy. If you reduce the energy, if you turn off the current, so that these messages are no longer conveyed from the environment to the mental coordinator, then the environment actually ceases to exist. Because it has no existence apart from sensory exception within that area. When we close the eyes, the visible universe vanishes. If we stop up the ears, the auditory universe vanishes. If we stop up the nose or get a good head cold, uh, then the sense of smell ceases to function. And the olfactory processes are no more. If by some way or condition uh, the sense of taste is destroyed, then flavors are no longer sensed. And paralysis can make it impossible to have any physical sensation of contact with another object. Thus, through the sensory perceptions alone, man is bound to the universe of phenomena, which is his principal seat of activity and thought. So it would also follow naturally that the individual could, through unconsciousness, through sleep and death, also achieve uh, the break between the mental coordinator and the phenomenal world of the physical existence. But philosophy is not concerned primarily with this break. It is not concerned with cutting off and destroying all contacts. And such concern might be present in certain advanced cases of mysticism where the individual is uh, completely determined to transcend all physical conditions. But for the average person who needs help because of pressures, because of difficulties, the important thing is to lower the rate of intensity of these reactions. The individual, by giving less energy to the sensory processes, will reduce the amount of phenomena which they carry to the mental coordinates. This permits the mental coordinator to slow down. It also permits the entire process to be subject to another faculty of the coordinator, which is usually not applied at all, and that is uh, thoughtfulness. Thoughtfulness requires a certain interval, a certain leisure, a certain power to contemplate events or conditions or facts with a kind of leisure. Now, if these facts tumble in too great a confusion, too rapidly and too intensely, thoughtfulness is, well, not only difficult, but usually impossible. So the problem comes of slowing this entire machinery down until it becomes controllable and directable. It is necessary to slow the traffic on this psychic freeway 
before everyone trying to drive the freeway is killed. And these uh, freeways are channels of communication between phenomena and the phenomenal interpreting center in man must be clarified, simplified, made orderly and direct. And uh, the person who wishes to have greater clarity in any area must simplify. Clarity is not the result of constant struggle. Clarity is the result of releasing the consciousness from the most dominant of those pressures which deny or make clarity impossible. To do this, in the Eastern philosophy, the individual is taught certain meditative disciplines, the tendency of them being to bring internal reaction, not to paralyze the sensory perception, but to direct it, to condition it, so that its testimonies will be more comfortable, more pleasant, and more meaningful. That gradually these uh, sensory perceptions are trained away from recording that which is worthless, recording that which is essentially untrue. Also, having reduced pressure, the mental coordinator can achieve that which is its peculiar symbol in the level of mentality, and that is righteous thinking a state of righteousness, or of being right. This rightness is the basis of true virtue, and therefore righteousness is rightness in the estimation of value, about which uh, we hear a little, but do not see or experience too much in daily life. As this the process of sensory reaction um, is slowed down. We then learn another lesson. We learn that the affairs of the outer life do not plunge through the subconscious into this mysterious intangible core that we have mentioned in the beginning. In other words, the uh, subconscious is not an open road into the eternal being behind man. This eternal being is non-operative as far as objectivity is concerned. For the cycle of awareness does not penetrate beyond this uh, mental coordinator, which is therefore properly to be described as the ego or the sattva or the self. The substance of all this conglomerate process together is the activity which we consider very often even spiritual, but which really is spiritual only in the peculiar definition of being vital, that it has vitality in it. It is not spiritual in the sense of having any virtue in it, any particular real or essential meaning. It is animate, but not truly living, because it is a series of intensities which are constantly pushing each other and themselves, moved on by the mysterious power of the human will. The sensory debit, or the sensory perception, might well be likened, therefore, to gates leading in to the subconscious. They are also the same gates which, in another way, have to be used uh, to reduce the internal pressure. Like the sacred bridge, traffic moves both ways. And on this problem, there is this, there should be this constant release or relief of that which is accumulated inside as pressure. Now, pressure can be released if it is constructive. And the pressure, if it is no more constructive than steam, can drive a steam engine. But the average person, psychologically speaking, discovers that almost any release of pressure results in detriment. He finds that his pressures are sickly. He finds that when he permits them, 
to break through, they damage it. They damage his outer life. But this can only mean that they are already damaging his inner life. So the release of these pressures through the outer life as a primary means of clarification is merely to throw confusion from the subjective to the objective. Though we may say this helps. It might help if the process could be caused to terminate there. If we could accept this subconscious pressure into the consciousness, rationalize it, organize it, survive it, and finally cast it away as a necessary refuge, if we could free the body of it, as we might free the body of toxins by catharsis, we might be all right. But the unfortunate problem is that as we are working with this load, a new load is developing. The very processes of eliminating set up situations which create a new load. The individual trying to extrovert some frustration breaks the law and goes to jail. A new group of pressures set in, moving back into a psychic integration with all the discontent and unadjustment of what he may well consider to be an unjust sentence. Everything continues to build up pressure. The only point in your oriental philosophy where this pressure can stop is when we no longer feed it. We must get at its fuel source. We must get at the cause of the pressure itself. And the cause of the pressure is the continuous acceptance into an organism of certain dangerous stimuli from the outside. This, then, is the beginning of your concept of mysticism, both in the East and in the West. We have in Christian mysticism the great sense of asceticism, which has been as strong in the West as it has been in Asia. We have the individual who renounces the world, who enters holy orders, who gives up all worldliness, who goes away into the mountains to become a hermit, who renounces most of the pleasures and wealth and advantages of life. He turns from fortune uh, to the black robe and goes alone into the wilderness, perhaps, or to become a servant of those in need or suffering. Uh, humility, uh, self-abnegation, uh, the individual gradually bringing his own nature into harmony with a contrition of spirit in which he accepts himself suddenly as being a very humble person, as being someone who must seek spiritual strength, who must turn to God and not his own opinion or security, and who can only find truth by the continual systematic renunciation of error. So we have it as the same principle in both the East and West. We have the individual sensing that the tremendous attachments of his consciousness to worldliness are the cause of his difficulty. So in the West we also live in another century. We live in a time when nearly all asceticism is uh, reserved for uh, very small groups of persons who have tremendous determination to advance some form of religious life. For the rest, asceticism does not seem to be very practical. It does not seem that we can survive, maintain the responsibilities with which we are duly burdened, and at the same time try to escape life, to escape living, or at least that phase of living which we associate with material existence. So almost all of these systems, whether of the East or West, have to be adapted. They have to be made available to the Western person in a form that you can take some advantage of without completely disorienting his way of life. Now, there is no actual answer to this that is complete. For well, obviously, a partial attachment is going to reduce the pressure, but not eliminate it entirely. 
The individual who makes a 10% adjustment will get a 10% result. There's no way in which a person can remain partly worldly and partly unworldly and have a completely unworldly release from worldliness. This is simply not possible. But fortunately, to the thinking of modern man, we are not at the moment uh, outright perfectionists. We are not demanding absolute happiness. We are not demanding absolute peace or absolute freedom from worldliness. What we are really seeking, at first at least, in our procedure, is to bring the situation into a tolerable state. We want to have a measure of security. We want to have a certain sense of integration. We want to be able to make important decisions more wisely than we make them now. We want to be as good as we can be. But we are not at all certain at the moment that we could be absolutely good, even if the opportunity offered itself. There are too many complications lying between. So instead of saying to the individual, leave the world, cause the end entirely of this fueling of the set of the machine of the six senses, provide it no gasoline, provide it no oil, provide it no compressed air, provide it nothing, so that the machine simply ceases to function. If it ceases to function, the mental coordinator ceases to function. And in the end, you have the paranirvana, or a complete extinction of the objective being. But instead of saying that, we take a different attitude. We say that it is perfectly conceivable that between a miserable state of subjective existence, such as we know now, and the ultimate in which we have no existence, there is the possibility of a middle ground. And that middle ground is to have a comfortable, pleasant, happy, and well-adjusted subconscious. It can still exist, but it doesn't need to be the endless botheration that it is to most folks. We might not say, I am ready to dispose of both my outer and my inner life, but we might be able to say, I will make certain corrections if, of my outer conduct if it will give me an endurable, happy, and normal inner life. If I can enjoy a good subconscious, I will accept that at the moment as being enough. And this, of course, is exactly how the great concept of Mahayana Buddhism came into existence. Because the paradise of Amitabha, suspended between the outer illusion and the absolute perfection, is this paradisical sphere of the individual with the happy subconscious. The happy subconscious being equivalent to Dante's paradiso, which is suspended between heaven and hell. The person who has a happy, comfortable, internal life may have considerable desire to enjoy it, uh, may feel that he has a right to be the person he would like to be, that he can do gracious things, that he can have beautiful thoughts. If he reaches nirvana, it may not be possible for him to listen any longer to some of the very fine Bach compositions. And he's very fond of Bach, and he likes a little occasional diversion in Beethoven. If he goes into uh, absolute Mahapara nirvana, he will not enjoy the beauty of the sunset anymore. He will not have the pleasure of gathering with his friends the old Chinese sages in the bamboo grove and writing good poetry for the common amazement of each other. There are a lot of pleasant things. He will not hear the laughter of children anymore if he retires forever into the foreverness of things. So that is not even particular with Western man, and increasingly so with Eastern man as he begins to take on more and more Western conditions and where the idea of comfort and success becomes strong status symbols, the point is no longer to the average person 
the complete rejection of the sensory machine and its functions. What is rather now sought is to feed this machine a kind of fuel which will enable it to pass through its processes in a quiet, orderly manner without tormenting the mental coordinator and will allow this coordinator in turn to put together the lovely and charming elements of a beautiful mosaic so that the final picture is delightful, constructive, useful, and inspiring. This is what the average person, I think in both the East and West, would want for today. This does not deny that he may have the sight, the sense, or the value that the beautiful mosaic, like the great palaces and temples of the past will ultimately crumble, that all conditioned existence must actually and finally be unsatisfactory. This uh, he may admit, but he still feels, and probably rightly, that for him the growth from the conditions that he knows to some state utterly beyond his comprehension is a slow and arduous one. And it is easier for him to go by single steps than to plunge into a situation over which he has no real aptitude. So we begin to work on the diet of the coordinator. We do not start essentially by fumigating the subconscious. We start by conditioning what we will permit to go into it. Here we take an objective stand based not necessarily always upon our own judgment, because our own judgment is arising from this coordinator and may not be sound. But we are also subject to the tremendous traditional pressure of ideals. In this same world that is giving us so many difficulties, there are also great structures of high and noble aspirations. Just as surely as we are confronted agelessly with the selfishness of man, so we are also confronted through time with the lofty unselfishness of man. We begin to see and realize what constitute the great lives, what constitute the real, essential, illumined purposes of dedicated human beings. And we are able, gradually, uh, through the sensory perceptions, becoming responsive to these things, uh, to develop a certain attitude of determination by which we begin to censor this process. Now, how we censor it is not the subject of this evening's talk, but we will come to that also. The principal purpose of the moment is that it is censored, and by degrees we censor what goes in, and that which goes in uh, must become the basis of that which is inside. It must be the food of the subconscious structure. So we try, little by little, uh, to visualize, to experience to become continuously aware of those qualities around us which we would like to have on the inside. And this brings us to the next step, of course, which in the Eastern philosophy is the use of the mandala. In the Western philosophy of psychology, the mandala is usually the drawing of an aberrated person by means of which we attempt to estimate the nature of the aberration. In other words, the mandala is a projection from the person and must therefore represent one of two things, either the state of his aberration or the basic understatement or archetypal statement of his own revulsion against this aberration, both of which represent the two poles of the mental coordinator struggling between the positive and negative experiences with which it is constantly being deluged. Thus, the theory of it is, in the West, that the moon dollar is a revelation by means of which the individual is releasing 
diagnostically, autodiagnostically, the situation in which he is in. That this, therefore, is much the spirit of Western art. Much Western art in the last 25 years is frankly psychotic. There is no other possible explanation that this is not said in the sense of a facetious remark. These people are sick. They are sick as we are all sick. The only thing is some of us can't draw. Therefore, we cannot make pictures of this sickness. Some of us simply howl in the night, that's all. Some of us walk the floor. Some of us uh, hate each other. Uh, some uh, compose strange and inharmonious uh, musical compositions. And some paint morbid and psychotic pictures. But all these things are the tale of suffering. They are the evidence of a great disorder within the psychic integration. So it's one thing to assume that this release is of value. I've always questioned it. I think these mandalas of these psychic drawings should be made at a certain stage. They do help in some conditions, particularly in advanced psychiatry, where it is actually necessary to get every fragment of available information concerning the aberration of the patient. But that these things should be hung in galleries for the edification of people, or that they should be placed over the mantle in someone's home, is like placing there a, a particularly choice fragment of deception, or something of that nature, and considering it artistic. Uh, the, uh, the real problem is these are clinical things. And as clinical things, they are valuable. As art, they are not valuable. If, however, we use the Eastern concept, it is not a problem of the individual drawing his aberration on, in two dimensions. The problem is that the individual should be confronted with a design or a pattern that moving in upon his subjective will do something to normalize it. The therapy lies, therefore, in the authenticity of the painting which is being contemplated. If this painting was contrived or conceived under inspiration by an individual in a very advanced state of mystical insight, if it was achieved through the internal experiencing of certain values which transcend both the subconscious and the conscious minds. This painting then becomes archetypal in a constructive sense. It is no longer the painting of a sickness. Even if the artist was not completely illuminated, it is certainly the picture of an aspiration. It is the picture of a motion toward betterness. It is a, a, a picture of appreciation, of realization, of the tremendous veneration for principles perceived and sensed. It is a story of universal unfoldment captured in a, a truly consecrated human soul. This type of picture, which is the Eastern Mandala theme, has been very carefully guarded in most of the Oriental sects where such paintings are produced. There are seldom any variations of any kind permitted from the original designs. These pictures have been copied 500 times, and not the slightest individuality can be detected. The later artists were avowedly and obviously copyists. They could not have devised the original design, but they preserved it. They preserved it for the benefit of those who came after, who would find in these designs a meditation, a conditioning uh, phenomenon, which could go into the consciousness to begin the process of therapy on the inside. Here was, or uh, here is, the mandala as environmental material transmitted by the sensory perception to the coordinate. But now these perceptions are carrying a valid testimony of value. 
the coordinator receiving this valid testimony is naturally going to react to it validly. At first, perhaps, with not much insight. At first, perhaps, with prejudice. But gradually, over a period of time, if the pressures of the non-valid testimonies are reduced and the unchanging pattern of validity remains, Gradually, the subjective becomes permeated with this archetypal form of harmony, beauty, order, symmetry, and the tremendous pressures also, of, uh, tremendous intense uh, psychic pressures of the patterns of principles and laws which are revealed through the design. The design is lawful. It is like baby's signatura realum, the seal of, of, of reality that is stamped upon the human heart. This seal of reality comes into the same sensory perception. But instead of leading to the pandemonium that we know now, the mandala ultimately causes the arising within the subconscious of the great mandala concept of the paradise of Amitabha. Here then, order inside begins to take over. This order taking over, it gradually creates its own constructive influences. These influences censor just as the wrong ones did, with the coordinator in estimating the reaction to sensory perception. And little by little, the individual begins to see and experience the validity of good. He begins to see the law operating around him, whereas previously he saw only disorder. Little by little, he is able to discriminate between various levels of sensory function. And he becomes more and more aware of the eternal presence of that which is essentially true. Thus, quieting down, releasing, and he finds greater tendency to use these perceptions to increase beauty, wisdom, and insight within himself. He turns to the arts not for a livelihood, but because they give warmth and peace to his soul. He begins to appreciate things that once he thought were foolish, because suddenly Simple, gentle, kindly things have great meaning. Little by little, this results in a relaxing, a letting down of the unreasonable and false pressures. The nature still lives in this world. It still functions here. It still does its daily work here, just as it always did. But it is in this world, but not of it. It continues to meet every responsibility, but it cannot be hurt by the illusion of worldliness. Because in order to be hurt, there must be this self, this ego that is always right and must therefore always suffer from the actions of others. The moment this ego principle relaxes, the moment we have no longer the great determination to be right or wrong. As soon as we have no vice to defend and no virtue to defend, we simply relax. And in the relaxation, we become right. We take away the pressures, and normalcy is that which remains when pressure is gone. In all these mystical systems, good is not something to be cultivated as a separate thing. You cannot water it and fertilize it and expect it to bear fruit. Good is normalcy. It is the reasonable. It is the right. It is the thing as it must be and as it should be and as it really is. Therefore, you do not create good. No one can. No one can, de can declare that there is more good in existence because he has done something. Good is that which is ever there, but is obscured by that which is not good. 
If therefore the individual ceases to do that which is not good, he is good. But in ceasing to do that which is not good, he does not become negative. He is not inactive. He simply must realize that good is not the opposite of evil. That good is that which eternally exists and which is obscured by pressure. As we relax pressure, as we cease to be ourselves, we are good. And in the larger mystical sense of the thing, when we totally cease to be ourselves, we are God. The, uh, the difference lies in this matter of estimating how we shall attain the end. We become God-like by attaining that state in which we are no longer like that which is not God, or is not good in its final sense. There is a little fable about it, which is rather uh, trite, but still has a bearing. Diogenes uh, said that the man who has least, as far as these worldly things are concerned, is most like God, inasmuch as God, as far as we can know, depends upon nothing that man can confer or anyone else can confer. Therefore, the individual who has the least and gives the most is most godlike.